Awesome. Well, thank you all again for coming. This is a really great session. I believe we have a virtual audience also, mm -hmm. yes? Mm -hmm. Erica, yeah, so we have a virtual audience. Hey, virtual audience. Uh, this is a discussion about the student-centered approach to, you know, ensuring that the whole learner is addressed within higher education institutions. We're pleased to have with us Michael Sorrell, who's the president of Paul Quinn University in Texas, Dallas, Texas, one of the um, uh, organizations that just celebrated 150-year anniversary. <laughs> And as I understand, you're the longest standing president within yeah, that. 15 industry. years. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Well, we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, just to give you all some context for our chat this morning, and I'm going to be using my device because I have notes on my device. Anybody else do that mm -hmm. when you're talking? Yeah. And I don't write things now because ordinarily I can't read my writing. <laughs> it's been that way since kindergarten. Yeah, teachers would write notes. <coughs> Flo needs to work on her penmanship. I did work on it, it just never improved, right? So I use my device for notes. But really the, the, the impetus for this conversation is really to identify what is the secret to success within Paul Quinn uh, University. And Michael, you successfully led the organization focused on this whole inclusive learning concept that really does ground the institution in moving uh, away from some of the standard approaches to how education uh, organizations address students, but really focus on what are all of the different components of the learner that make up you know, the pieces part so that you deal with a number of things that could impact learning. And so we'll hear about what it looks like within the Paul Quinn Institution and how we can take from the, this discussion lessons learned. Right? How can we be more effective leaders? What is it that we can put into place? Just to get a pulse check in the room, Who's associated with the higher education institution? I'll see. And what do you want? What, what would you like to get by the end of this session? If you could think of one thing, who can share? Better language to justify how to design the university to be more inclusive. Okay, mm -hmm. that's fair. And Robert, yes, yep. thank you so and much. What, what school is it? Uh, university of Maine at Augusta. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so on another hand, yes? Yes, I'm, I'm from Mexico City. I'm running a university in Mexico City. Okay. And you know, I, I would like to, it says about designing a uh, university, but I'm, I'm very interested in, you know, curriculum design in terms of inclusivity, how to do that better, how to think about it better, like very concrete, uh, ideally, because uh, you know, we talk about so many things. In the yeah. Future, but like, what would be, I, I would love something like, Ten things you would recommend. Oh wow! Ten? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a tenth of the ten. Uh, I love your style. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Okay, well, if you have any of those, uh, come on, say Yes. Okay. Okay. Much of stuff. So one of the things that I think is really important. Thank you for thank you for that. One of the things that's important. You know, we like to get out of these audiences. What do you <coughs> come here for? And how can you lead with the practical application that you can immediately go back and instill within your organization? That's important for a couple of reasons. One, how many times have you gone to a, a, a conference like this and you're so motivated and you're like, at the end of the day, you're like, yes, I can do it. And then you, a week later, think, what was I supposed to do? <laughs> right? <laughs> so we want you to make sure that you're engaged in this conversation so that yes, I can do it extends to you know, practices within your organization. So I am Flo Starks. My pronouns are she, her. I identify as a 50-year-old black woman who was also a mother, a daughter of an uh, Air Force veteran. I'm also a sister, cousin, auntie, and friend. Right? <laughs> and so I'm, again, happy to be here with you all. I'm also the Chief Diversity Officer at Pearson. And you know, we absolutely are thankful that you all decided to select this session so that you can learn and grow because that's really our purpose, right? To add life to a lifetime of learning. So welcome to this session. Michael, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure, uh, my name is Michael Sorrell. I'm the president of Ball Point College. Uh, I am a father of two, a husband to one, um, and I am a nation builder. So that's what we're doing at Ball Point, we're building a nation. That's awesome. I love it. I usually say I'm an inclusive champion. So we got the nation builder, the inclusive champion, and however you all identify. I wish we had time to go around the rooms to do introductions. But let's just get into it. So just mention that Paul Quinn just celebrated 150 years. Tell us what that journey has been like for the time that you've been with the institution, but just give us some of that historical view sure, on the sure. part well, we are a historically black college university. Um, so we were founded to educate free slaves and their progeny. Um, we were founded because 
America was not set up to incorporate four million previously enslaved individuals who needed a pathway to life as a citizen in a country that never intended for them to be citizens. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have, through the 150 years, been in Austin, Texas, where we were found in 1872, Waco, Texas, where we were, uh, I guess we moved in 1877, and then in 1990 we moved to Dallas. And our school is founded, was founded by the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and they took a very different approach to education. Uh, they were fiercely independent um, and managed the schools themselves, funded the schools themselves, and, and had a number of colleges and universities, right? Felt, felt very, very strongly about the need to have self-determination. Um, and when you are an AME school, rebellion and fight is in your DNA, right? This is a denomination that, you know, over 200 years ago had to sue for the right to exist. Um, and, you know, it was not a friendly court system back then, uh, but they won. And, you know, they, for Paul Quinn, for the majority of its existence, it's been an institution that took students who didn't have a lot of options and loved them up, right? Um, which is noble, which is wonderful. However, um, it oftentimes can produce, produce situations where you're not economically as well off as you would like. And Paul Quinn struggled for a long period of time. And in 2006, 2007, Boston Consulting Group came in, did a um, evaluation of the institution, and determined that if it didn't make dra dramatic changes, it would be insolvent in 18 months to two years. Um, and so I was recruited to be the president. Um, and you know, I tell people all the time, I was not the first choice. Uh, I was actually the absolute last choice, and I know that because I was on the board and I saw all the people who turned to the board they got to me. You got right. the intel. Uh, right, right, right. Uh, but, you know, I took the job in part because I owe a debt of gratitude to historically black colleges, for which I can never fully repay. Um, everyone in my family, with the exception of my, one of my first cousins and myself, who went to college, went to historically black colleges. And the schools invested deeply in my people and in my community. And where I come from, you say thank you. Mm -hmm. right. Now, I did not plan to say 15 years of thank you. <laughs> um, I was an interim president. I was at the time, I was part of a group that was negotiating to buy an NBA franchise. I was going to be part owner and be president of the franchise. As I like to tell people, I was headed to the Range Rover phase of my life. Right? Um, and I made the worst Range Rover decision in the history of mankind. Uh, but, you know, the beauty of where we are is we're an institution completely dedicated to solving problems, right? And we solve the every person's problem, right? We ask, what is important to you? Right? So the first thing that I would tell our friend from Mexico in my list of 10 uh, <laughs> right. is, right, is to ask the questions that the students need asked. Mm -hmm. right? Not the questions you want asked, not the questions that get you to the answers that you're hoping to find out, but be authentically and genuinely interested in the well-being of your students. And if you do that, it leads you to some really interesting places. Because I submit to you, the only reason I am sitting here in front of you today as someone who had no prior experience in higher education or education, a point my sister, who is a 30-year teacher in Chicago, loves to remind oh, wow. me of, um, is because we answered the questions that the students had, and we tailored an institution to fit their needs. Um, and it's not that hard. But you do have to let go of this notion of what came before you. Yeah. There can be no sacred cows. Mm -hmm. right? And the pace of change that we're experiencing now is such that, candidly, you can hold on to the past all you want, mm -hmm. and that will be all you hold on to. Mm -hmm. right? Because you'll be left by the wayside. Yeah. You must build in the method to continuously innovate, and that's what we do. So innovation really starts in the conversation, it sounds like. And you know, it sounds like also being vulnerable enough to break away from perhaps some of the social norms that you see in well, education. But, so I would challenge you on that. Why is that vulnerable? 
Well, because a lot of people are unwilling to move out of the space to just have a conversation about what a student wants, right? Well, well, of, what are they doing? Exactly. So they fall back to what that tradition in higher education is in that I have the experience and I know what's best for you. And I sort of liken that to something my dad would always tell me, probably still says it. I've been where you're going. I'm like, but maybe my path is a little bit different than yours. Well, but so I, I would tell you that it's arrogance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like. The arrogance of assuming you know the answer for other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The arrogance of assuming that just because something's been done that way forever, that it merits being continued. Because look, let's be honest, if that was the case, there would be no societal change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Our institutions were not made for women. They were not made for diverse populations. Like if we didn't ask questions, that never would have happened. Candidly, if someone didn't ask questions, you and I wouldn't be sitting here because right. we'd still be slaves. Yeah. Right? So you have to understand that this notion that, you know, it's risky to change, it's not risky to change, it's yeah. risky to not change. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and the, the, I love what you just said because people change when they see the value in changing as opposed to staying the same. Right, and so when you're open to and more empathic about another person's situation, what the human condition looks like, and how people can evolve to a different something, and work together to have to create that understanding, that's where we can address the inequity. So I used to believe that. You did. I did. Mm -hmm. um, what changed? Well, I realized that people are inherently selfish, mm -hmm. and so you have to speak to their self-interest. And I'll tell you what helped me get there. So in my previous life. Uh, part of what my scholarship was in, it was in civil rights movement mm -hmm. and things of that nature. And in my constitutional law class, first day of constitutional law at Duke, I had a professor, Walter Dellinger, who you may have heard, he was the Solicitor General under President Clinton, and he begins the lecture. He said, I want you to close your eyes for a moment and to imagine that you're an African American family and you are living in the North and you want to go visit your relatives in the South. And you have to call ahead to find a place to stay in maybe Memphis, right? Because that typically was the midway point. You can't stay in a hotel because it's Jim Crow South or Jim Crow America. You can't stay in a hotel. You pack lunches, you pack sandwiches because you can't stop at restaurants. Mm -hmm. And you leave at 3, 4 a.m. so you can have as much daylight as possible as you're on the road so that you don't wind up being a victim. So he's walking through all of this, and I feel a chill go down my spine because my parents grew up in the Jim Crow South. That, even though I did not grow up yeah. in Jim Crow, but that was our experience. I grew up in Chicago, where we would go to New Orleans to see our family, or Waterproof, or Natchez, Mississippi. We'd leave at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. I can still close my eyes and taste the ham sandwiches with mayonnaise and plastic wrap. <laughs> no foil, huh? Uh, no, like, no foil. Like, I don't know what, there was a foil moratorium. Okay? Um, but, and so he said, so he started walking through that experience, right? And, and it's taking me back. And I never thought about that, mm -hmm. right? I never thought that that's why my parents did it. It was just, they were world trips, they were field trips. We had a great life, it was fun, you know? Um, I love traveling with my parents. And he said, the civil rights movement did not, was not won until they figured out that the Commerce Clause was what you needed to use to defeat Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't the moral imperative, it wasn't that this was the right thing to do, it was that under the laws of the federal government you could no longer justify the unreasonable restriction mm -hmm. on interstate commerce. Mm -hmm. It wasn't justice. It was capitalism, right? It was self-interest. Yeah. And so I like to believe people will do the right things for the right reasons, and I try to push them to do so, but I promise you, I lace every justice movement with some self-interest for the parties that I am speaking to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wish it wasn't that way, but yeah. it is what it is. It is what it is, seriously. And I think that your influence then has really shaped forward then, you know, a, a certain focus on students. Absolutely. Though, right? You mentioned Absolutely. that. If you could think about the one thing that you've been most proud of in your time with Paul Quinn so far, what would that be? No, oh, I mean, I, I have a handful of students whose stories are 
extraordinary and to see them make it through yeah. and see who they become, right? I mean, listen, I get that people are obsessed with scale and bigness, right? But when you are dealing with marginalized communities, mm -hmm. there is a personal connection, right? People want to know that you understand who they are mm -hmm. and whose they are. And that's not always available in a hundred thousand person, you know, institutions. And so for us, I'm I'm proud, first of all, that we never took a knee. Right? Even in our darkest days. And there were dark days. There were days where I had to go home to my wife and tell her that I may have to take my 401k to make payroll. Mm -hmm. Right? Before we got there, there were days like when I my <laughs> current wife, I had to you know, prolonged when we got engaged because I took a 40% pay cut to take the job, then had to cut my salary another 25% because we just didn't have the resources, yeah. right? And, you know, to say, we're going to have to delay starting our life because I took this job that you were the only person who thought this was a good idea, right? <laughs> the rest of my friends were kind of like, you can't make it worse, right? <laughs> um, and so there were tremendous personal sacrifices yeah. involved, but to watch the staff that has been there during that time and to see the joy in their eyes as new buildings are built, as new academic programs are added, as we've become a national darling, um, to see students who no one believed in, mm -hmm. believe in themselves and learn to dream bigger dreams, um, that like the rest of them, I mean, like we look, we've raised graduation rates. It'll be just about forty percent this year. Um, we've improved retention rates by 30, 40 yeah. percent. We built the first new buildings in 40, 50 years. We've done, we've done things that, yeah. by all other standards, would make people really proud. Yeah. The thing I'm most <coughs> proud of is to see people believe in themselves. Yeah. Right. That so means important. everything. So let's unpack that. You you know talk about this inclusive student-centered approach. What does that mean? And how do you get a university of leaders and students even, as you mentioned, to believe in themselves? How does that work? Well, you know, first of all, you don't give people a choice, mm. right? Like I mean, this is so. Listen, I think I think in the name of convenience, many leaders acquiesce when sometimes you just have to say, this is what's right, yeah. mm -hmm. and this is what we're going to do. So I, I'm always fascinated with the diversity, equity, and inclusion movement, right? And for the record, I absolutely believe in it. I think it's wonderful. I think, I just think it's sad that we have to have offices devoted to getting people to do the right thing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like, why? Why can't we just treat people the way that they need to be treated? Yeah. Right? Now, we know why. That will be right? a whole other discussion. Right, that's a whole other discussion. Right? But at, at our place, um, I, I remember sitting in my office and just frustrated. Right, those first, like those first two years, we lost 400 students. Mm -hmm. We only had 550 to start with. Um, we, everyone said we were going to fail. Um, at every turn, I was met with disappointment. Um, I would be ridiculed at the supermarket, right? Like, I'm just trying to buy some cereal. <laughs> and folks are, you know, making fun of us. Um, and, and I could never understand the hatred people had, because we weren't that big of a school, mm -hmm. right? But what I realized is that hope is a precious commodity. And when you're dealing with people who have been disappointed, who have been lied to, every institution in their life has disappointed them, when the one that they think won't does, the venom yeah. that comes from that is, is horrific. And so, you know, I, I think about what culture you need to create to get people to believe. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting at my desk and I was kind of like, we need something to believe. And I grew up in Chicago. I'm a big city kid. I have big city cynicism. I think a lot of what I'm about to tell you is horribly corny. Right? <laughs> and frankly, I would sit at my desk and be like, I can't believe I'm about to become this guy. <laughs> um, and I, I sat there one day and I said, we need something. 
It's like, all right, I can't sell what I don't believe. What do I believe in? What are my core values? And I was like, well, my parents used to always tell me to clean up after myself, leave places better than you found them. So we're going to leave places better than we found them. I thought about that I went to a Jesuit school. Jesuits tell you to be men and women for others. Um, so that became love something greater than yourself. Mm -hmm. um, when I was 13 years old, a freshman in high school, I took a world history class that talked about Renaissance men and women and about how they were individuals whose accomplishments in their eras lasted throughout time. So at 13, I was kind of like, I'm going to be a Renaissance man. Yes. Right? <laughs> um, so that became live a life that matters. Yeah. Um, and then I'm horribly impatient. I hate being told I have to wait my turn for things. Right? So that became lead from wherever you are. So those became our four L's of Quinai leadership. Then thought What's about. The first one? I, I didn't the first one. Ah, lead places better than you found them. Okay, yeah. yeah got it. So we're two now. So I'm working on this. Right? So yeah, two. Listen, I know what four. Else on four. Ah, there we go. We're building a movement. We're now up to five. We got fours or up to five, right? Lead places better than you found them. Live a life that matters, lead from wherever you are, and love something greater than yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and then I thought about this idea in, about collectives, right, and about doing great things together, um, and what's needed to be able to do that. And I thought about the selflessness again, yeah. and you know, being men and women for others, and we created this institutional ethos, we over me. The needs of a community supersede the wants of an individual. Well, so now we had a core set of institutional values rooted in this notion of bigger things for more people and selflessness. Um, then, you know, thought about the fact that we needed a way to communicate that we were going to be a place for everyone. Uh, because, you know, one of the greatest fallacies is people think historically black colleges were only for black people. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, those were the white schools. They were only for, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. We were open to everyone from the beginning. Um, and so we came up with this, you know, version of you can be our kind even if you're not our color. And we just need you to be our kind. Mm -hmm. um, and then we needed a character test. Choose the harder right over the easier wrong without apparent regard to self-interest. Now, when you put all these things together, it leads you to the one inescapable conclusion that you are there for someone else. Yeah. You are there to serve. So your, your days start with how are you? What do you need? Are we living up to our promise to you? And you have to be willing for people to say, no, mm -hmm. you're not. I need this. You, at, you promised. You didn't deliver. Go fix it. And that then gives you the opportunity to have an environment of continuous improvement, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And you have to have, you have to be able to say to people, I'm not always going to get this right. Yeah. But I ask you for the honor of the attempt to get it right. Mm -hmm. If I mess up, hold me accountable. Give me an opportunity to fix it. If I disappoint you again, I deserve whatever you want yeah. to say about me. But none of us are finished products and none of us are going to be finished products. So let's get in the mindset of we are continuously improving. It sounds like such an interesting journey, and all I can think about is how long did it take you to get people on board, really? Because I know you said don't give people the option, yeah, right? You know, but the well, I'm a big guy. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, pretty tall. We, we right? can handle this any way you want to handle it, right? You can come along with the charm, or you can come along yeah. with the arms, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a, a former leader told me, flow people are going to change or they're going to change. Right? So. <laughs> I mean, but no, I, I think, listen, I, crises do not breed the, let me, let me say it a different way, right? Um, the board had already made a decision. Mm -hmm. We were going to do what was necessary to maintain our existence. Mm -hmm. They had already said to me, we are turning you loose to do this the way you see fit. So the discussion of whether or not we were going to make radical change had already been decided. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to do those things, then you are the one that is being a contrarian and actually being disloyal to the institution. Now, my job was never to abuse anyone. 
my job was to give people a sense of what we could do together and yeah. to be great together and to produce wins, but also to understand that everyone wants to be a star. Mm -hmm. Right? Everyone, everyone in this room wants to be a star. Right? Like you want to be great at what you do. And if someone says to you, I'm going to show you a pathway to be great, and then they stand with you shoulder to shoulder, and then when you do something impressive, they hold you up. Yeah. They make room for your talents and your gifts mm -hmm. and tell their stories. Because see, to me, like I don't, I, I never spent time self-promoting. Right? Like that, I, I find it distasteful. Right? What I will do is aggressively tell the story of my institution, my students, and my staff and faculty. Mm -hmm. Right, and I will fight you to make sure that they get their day in the sun. Not you personally. <laughs> yeah. You're not I'm in not harm's a way, right? Yeah. right? But a little verbal. <laughs> yeah. But but it, it's it's people need to know that like you actually care about yeah. them. And there were some people who fought it, right? I, absolutely. And, and look, let me be very clear. The amount of stress that I was under, because it was a very public role. Right. And, you know, people would tell me all the time, you have destroyed your career. You didn't have to go do this. You were on this upward trajectory, and you took a risk. And what are you going to do next? Right? And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do next because I'm not going to fail. Right? We're not going to fail. We're going to do something extraordinary. And um, people believe in it. And, and look, the bigger issue is not everyone has the skill set required for that moment in time. Mm -hmm. There will come a time where my skill set isn't the right one for Paul Quinn. And I have to have the maturity to tip my hat, say thank you for the honor of what it's been, and then go do something else. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, now, I want to be clear, I hope it's not that time yet, <laughs> right? But when it is that time, yeah. I have to be able to recognize that. And so does everyone else. And so, um, we, you know, some people came along because they saw the value in what we were doing. Some people came along because they were through, they had been there and wanted to, they had been there for the down times, they wanted to be there for the up times. Some people came along because it, it's, it spoke to them, it resonated with them. Um, some people, you know, are charmed to come along, mm -hmm. right? Some people I replaced and got other people who wanted to come right. along. Um, it, you just, my grandmother told me from the time I was a little boy, she said, baby boy, sometimes you got to give them what the hand calls for, mm -hmm. right? I gave people what the hand calls yeah. for. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful story. Beautiful saying. I'm going to remember that. Uh, I cleaned <laughs> it up. You're from mom. <laughs> I, I, I cleaned it up. I cleaned it up. My, okay. my grandmother was tough. Okay. Well, listen, certainly that's rubbed off a bit, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so one of the things that you mentioned in terms of, you know, your leadership style, leading from where you are. Talk about how that is, how you bring that to fruition, right? What does that mean? Uh, well, I, I am authentic. Yeah. Right, like I, I will share the highs and the lows, right? I, I don't, um, you know, I don't come from this place that strength means you can't be weak at moments, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I've had things that have happened that I have shared with my staff, and some of them have been emotional enough where I've broken down in tears, right? Um, and I've talked about when I've messed up, and when I mess up, I own it, mm -hmm. right? And it's, and it's interesting because, you know, when you succeed in things, people like to talk about you and you know, all that other stuff, right? So if you aren't careful, you can actually believe your own press clippings, mm -hmm. which is the absolute worst thing you can ever do. Um, but I was taught that at a young age. When I was a high school sophomore, my athletic ability started to gain notoriety. And my high school coaches pulled me over and said, never believe your own press clippings. On the days when they tell you you were great, you were never that good. <laughs> On the days when they tell you you were horrible, you were never that bad. Stay humble, stay even keeled, and keep moving forward. Right? Yeah. And that's, I mean, I just, you know, it's the same thing like when I teach my classes with my students, I answer any question they want to ask me. And I talk about the hardships, right? I talk about the things I've struggled with. Like, I, my, my life is an open book, right? Like, I don't have anything I'm ashamed of because, one, I try not to do things I'd be ashamed of. Yeah. But, but two, my failures, my stumbles have 
pushed me forward in a way. Like, look, we failed at being a regular college at Paul Quinn. So we made up our own version of higher education, right? Um, I, you know, I was married before. I failed at that first marriage. It set me up for the best marriage. I, I could not even imagine yeah. that I would have the family I have now, right? But that is a product of those things. Um, so we're going to stumble in life. Mm -hmm. We're going to have failures. It's what you do next that defines you, right? So I'll stumble, but I will never fall. Yeah, right? yeah. What you just said reminds me of uh, Mandela who says, you know, he doesn't lose, he either yeah. learns or wins, right? And I think that's a tremendous other thing that I thought of when you were talking was about, you know, the, there's a, a proverb that says, even a giant looks in the mirror and doesn't see that image. And so that humility, that degree of, of care for others because you don't think so highly of yourself. <coughs> I think, well, I think so the awesome. more success you have, the more humble you should be. Oh, for sure. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, um, I mean, I, I, I understand that I have succeeded because people have made the choice to trust me, mm -hmm. right? And all I want to do is honor their trust. Yeah, that's beautiful. My philosophy is leading with love. Ah, so you know that's our thing. Yeah. Right? But that's, that's yeah. coming soon. Yeah. That's something to share with you, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so but I got there. Like I had to I had to learn yeah. to lead with love. Yeah, yeah. And what does that mean, right? Yeah, yeah it, it, it's it's another session, right? It's another yeah. topic. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big one. Let's turn to say amen. 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 Uh let's see. Uh Excuse me, really quickly. You had a question about learning design? Uh, sort of, yeah. I'm actually writing down, I asked for language, so yeah. I'm writing down language. To yeah. We're going back, I uh, am the Executive Director of Academic Services at our university, and I'm at a place where uh, we are trying to reimagine how our learning design shop and faculty development shop also partners with our student support and development tutoring and accessibility accommodation shop mm -hmm. so that we're designing learning from day one to minimize the need, the exclusion, and maximize awareness that I think as you said, um, or something like you said, um, all our students have extraordinary stories, celebrate their success, mm -hmm. day one. Yeah. And so, yeah. So yeah. I, I would, if I can make a suggestion yeah. to you, um, give the students agency to tell their story. Yeah. Right? So I don't believe in deficit anything. Right? No deficit. Like, we are going to focus on what you do well. Right? I teach classes, and every class we start with what's on your mind. Right. Right? And give people the chance to sort of engage you and to talk about their dreams. And you know, I always ask the students, like, tell me your dreams. And once you start with people sharing their dreams, like you've built a connection that is, you know, difficult to shake. And, you know, we spend so much time telling students what they aren't good at. Mm -hmm. right? So much time. Like, it's depressing. And that power of suggestion mm -hmm. can define some people. Sure. Right? Like, and no, no. Like, give them a chance to stand up and talk about what they're most excited about. And then you redefine your engagement with them. Right? right? It's just, like, I don't think any of it, like, one, I think you all are asking exactly the right questions. And, sure. Um, but I don't think any of this has to be as hard as people make it. Um, a lot of this is just golden rule stuff. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, just, and also asking yourselves, what was interesting to you? Right, what do you wish your educational experience had been? Right, like my collegiate education came alive when I took a class, my intro to a government class. I started out a very unsuccessful pre-med major. Because right. um, it turns out you can't be an athlete, major in pre-med, and go to all the parties. <laughs> Something's got to give. Right? Something's got to give. Uh, unfortunately, my, my, my genetics courses gave. Um, but the, the reality of it was I took this government class, and the teacher was completely outside the box. And he, he gave me a gift that I never could have imagined, right? He, he told me what my gifts were, right? Mm -hmm. And now he did it in a, in a humbling way. He gave me a D on a paper, right? Now here's the thing, at Oberlin, 
We didn't have Ds. You couldn't get a grade lower than a C minus. So he gave me a grade that didn't exist. Right now, some context. We were supposed to have been following a story through the New York Times for a period of time, write a paper about it, right? I waited until we got back from a road trip and a game to start the assignment. So by the paper I turned in, it was terrible, right? <laughs> so he gives me a D, I have to go talk to him, and he's sort of like, do you know what your gifts are? You know, and it was really uncomfortable, right? Because, you know, you're kind of squirming, like, I, I, I guess, I don't know. And he said, well, and he proceeded, proceeded to tell me, he said, but let me tell you what the problem is. He's like, you are charming. You are charming in a way that most people are. And so people have bought your bullshit. <laughs> right? Pardon my language. <laughs> um, I didn't say what you think I said. All right? um, but it was, he said, so here's the thing. If you live your whole life thinking your gift is your style, you betray the gift as actually your substance. Mm -hmm. He's like, substance must meet style. He's like, if you will trust me and commit to developing your substance, he's like, I promise you, you will go places you haven't yet thought about. And that made all the difference, yeah. right? I took all of his classes. Um, I, I like, I learned, and but his classes were always outside of the box, you know. And I just thought about, it, I was like, I love this. I love this. And so now, with higher education, I'm like. Why do we have to do anything other than that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. And it turns out students respond to it. That's awesome. Well, interesting you mentioned the student response. How are you measuring the outputs and how have they changed over the years, given your approach? Well, so when I started, we had a 1% graduation rate. Right? Yeah, no. And we had to round up to get to 1%. <laughs> um, we effectively were a school that was just admitting more people than we would. It was a betrayal of the trust that that community placed in us. Um, we, at this current cycle of students, are projected to graduate at 40% graduation rate. Right now, I'm not happy. I think people send you their kids, you should graduate them. Like I want a 90, 95% graduation rate. But I have a 75, 80% Pell Grant rate, and we came from the bottom. So improving your graduation rate, 35, 40%, we're going to have to be okay with that for a little while, right? Um, so we measure it that way. 80% of our students have jobs at commencement, right? We measure it that way. In their field. In, their, in whatever field it is they choose okay. they want to go into. Because we're an urban work college. We created our own model. All of our students get jobs, and they work an average of 15 hours per week. And what we're seeing is students will major in things because it's what they've seen. Mm -hmm. But as you expand what they are exposed to, they change what it is they want to do. And sometimes it's just more efficient to finish out the major you're in, but you've had this internship experience, mm -hmm. so you go get that job. And we have three tiers of education at our school. You have your subject matter expertise, which is what you major in. You have the experiential learning, which is the work program. And then we have certificate programs where every student, uh, each year, you get at least one certificate. So if a student leaves us after a year, they don't wind up in poverty. Because, you know, the first one actually was funny because you guys did some research for us and told us the place to start was the Microsoft Office Suite, right? Because in Microsoft Office Suite, you can make $60,000, $70,000 a year. You're no longer in poverty. And, you know, I had this really unenlightened soul once say to me, well, if they can make that much money after one year, why would they stay? You know, I'm kind of like, listen, dumb dumb. The reason they stay is because if you can do that much with them after one year, what can you do after four? Exactly. Right? Um, but that's that negative deficit mindset at work. Um, so we measure it through some of the traditional measures, but we also measure it just by, you know, we send a student to go work at the Carlisle Group, right? One of the top venture capital firms, private equity firms in the world. That's never happened. We've got students who have gone to Ivy League graduate schools. That had happened yeah. before. Um, we, like, the traditional measure of success, the quantitative, the qualitative, all of them are present. Um, and, but again, we keep asking the question, what could we have done better? Yeah. How do we get this better? How do we improve? 